All right. So now with Wittgenstein and Moore out of the way, we're going to discuss Chisholm, Sellers, and Davidson. Starting with Chisholm, as pictured in the top picture, does go in order. Um, he thinks that there are three components to the given. There is A, every statement which we are justified in thinking that we know is justified in part by some statement which justifies itself. So he, this claim is the claim that any justified statement ultimately rests on a self-justified statement. Um, and then B, there are statements about appearances which justify themselves. Now, this is an existential claim. Um, there exists at least one statement about appearance such that it justifies itself. But that leaves open the entirety of um, statements that justify themselves. It could be that uh, certain other attitudes play this role as well. Maybe even um, non-observational sentences play this role. Maybe even statements about logic play this role or axiomatic statements in logic or mathematics. We just don't know. Um, and Chisholm doesn't really give us more than that until later. And then you have C, which is the version uh, that Chisholm uh, goes to some length to deny. Uh, the phenomenalist version of the given, which is there are no self-justifying statements which are not statements about appearances. Um, this is a universal claim as opposed to an existential claim. And so I've written the contrapositive. For all statements, if they're self-justifying, then they're about appearances. So this does say something about the entirety of self-justifying statements, namely that they're all about appearances. So B says there's at least one that's about appearances. C says they're all about appearances. All right. So why is the third component false? Um, so claims about appearances are just simply not sufficient to exhaust the set of self-justifying claims. And he gives this argument in section eight of the paper which goes from pages 85 to 87 in the anthology. Um, I'd say it's about midway through the paper. But he says, uh, maybe three quarters or two thirds the way. But he says um, the function of some locutions uh, is, is such that they end up being self-evident. And he gives the example, I believe that Socrates is mortal. Um, and he says, well, clearly that claim must be self-justifying. Why? Well, because in order for it to be true, one would have to actually believe uh, what they say they believe. And then um, if that's true, then they believe that they believe that Socrates is mortal. Um, it's true that they believe that Socrates is mortal. And then they're having that very belief justifies their claim that they believe, right? Uh, so you can get a kind of JTB reading out of what Chisholm says, and this, though this is not uh, exactly how he puts it, um, the point stands that the relationship here is between one of truth 
and justification um, just on the assumption that the person isn't lying to you. They're asserting, I believe, that Socrates is mortal, um, is going to be justified by the, um, the truth uh, or the, the obtaining of that belief itself. Now, if you wanted to give a more Salarzian gloss, you can say um, your believing justifies your belief that you're believing, and um, your believing comes in the form of awareness, and then if someone challenges you about um, your belief that you believe that Socrates is mortal, then you will attend to um, that internal state as it relates to the uh, thing that you believe, right? So when someone says, what's your justification um, for believing that you believe that Socrates is mortal, you'll just turn inward to that belief and its being there will be all the justification that you need. I mean, this is, sorry, this is Chisholm's argument for that. Um, and I think it's a little shifty, but we'll keep going. So now on the sellers. So, Sellers um, is famously a pragmatist. I think you can think of everyone except for maybe um, Chisholm in this group that I'm covering as pragmatists of one kind or another. So um, he thinks, right, that um, it's not infelicitous to say that empirical knowledge rests on a foundation, but he does think that that foundation can't just be um, self-justifying claims, individual self-justifying claims, um, and they can't be simply observation sentences or appearances um, that just we're aware of and we um, have privileged epistemic access to. So what's his argument for this? Well, he thinks that um, when we assert something, say that P is green, right? And maybe this happens in our heads, and maybe it's just a form of awareness, um, but our being able even to recognize that something is green requires um, us to know how to deploy an assertion of the form X is a reliable symptom of Y. Um, and I write here as an example, green appearances are reliable symptoms of green things, uh, all else being equal, that's what ceteris paribus means, which I then elaborate into uh, in normal lighting conditions, with functioning perceptual faculties, and non septical scenarios, da 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 da. So the seller's point is, for you to be in the epistemic privileged position to be able to assert with knowledge that something is green requires of you um, a whole host of other concepts and knowledge, including understanding which conditions are normal and which aren't, um, and really importantly, the conditions for when you should apply a general form of claim, namely X is a reliable symptom of Y. Now, um, I am equating here privilege or entitlement to making a claim with authority. And one could worry 
I mean, I worry at least that there might be conflation about the notion of authority here. All that authority means in this context is you're having the right or power or opportunity to do something according to some norm. Um, and the norm of assertion is pretty standard. It's just don't assert P unless you know that P. Um, it's a prescription. Don't do this unless something else happens. Or, contrapositively, only assert things, only assert things when you know them to be true. All right? It's a moral-ish kind of thing, but it's pretty bland um, and thin when it comes to morals. It's really just an epistemic norm, and it's mostly pragmatic. Um, and there are a million counterexamples to the claim that um, the norm of assertion is like a moral dictum. So it's, it's really better just thought of as, you know, do you want to have good um, cooperative conversation? Great. Well, if that's how you want it, and if you want to like go about the world like most normal people do, then you'll just not assert things unless you know them to be true. Okay. So this is where authority comes from. Um, it comes from a long history of getting comfortable with a certain set of concepts and with the deploying of certain forms of statement when those statements and uh, the deployment of that form is felicitous or opportune. So, how does Sellers get this off the ground? Well, he thinks that our coming to be comfortable with a set of um, concepts and their use relies on a certain kind of education within a linguistic community. So, we'll be learning as we grow up when to say of things that they're a certain color. Evidence suggests from the empirical side that this usually happens by use of objects with colors, um, and that it's more felicitous to tell small children, hey, look at the chair, it's green. Um, so as to identify the objects prior to the colors, or in other words, to identify the colors through the identification of the object. Now, um, when the child in this scenario says something, say, oh, the chair is green, intuitively we understand at that young age when we're teaching the child that they don't know that the thing is green, um, at least in the sense that they don't know how to use that sentence the way we do. And this is Seller's point. Only after they've been educated well enough by the linguistic community will they be in a position to know that deploying the form of proposition or statement X is a reliable symptom of Y, or in this case the appearance of green is a reliable indicator of greenness in such a way that one can say the chair is green. Um, that's a late development uh, and one which only requires the upbringing, the teaching, and the practice that one usually gets when one's mastering their native language. Um, so Sellers kind of toes the line here. He wants to say, well, for any of these kinds of claims to express knowledge, it has to be the case that when you're applying the rule, so to speak, um, when, you're, when you're deploying the form correctly, you know that that's what you're doing. You're aware of that, um, which 
implies that you have a history of doing so. But importantly, that doesn't mean that you've always known or that you've always been able to deploy that form. It just means that there's enough of a recent history of your knowing how to do so that on the instance that we're discussing, I can say they know. And this kind of thing is um, related to Aristotle's distinction between acting in accordance with virtue and virtuous action. So if you ever have the time, you should read, I believe, the third book of the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, and in it, he distinguishes between acting in accordance with virtue and acting virtuously. And he says, basically, that children are brought up, when they're brought up well, to act in accordance with virtue, but they haven't developed an ability to act virtuously yet because they don't have their own reasons for acting virtuously yet, and they haven't learned um, how to act virtuously in the sense of acting from virtue. They are just taught to act in virtuous ways, and they have certain exemplars, and they're given certain didactic lessons and such that help them. Um, but it's only when they've really practiced enough and come into their own with respect to their rationality and um, have been around long enough to experience various situations that gave them the opportunity to act virtuously, only after some history of learning in a moral community that teaches you, um, do you stand in a position to act virtuously as opposed to simply in accordance with virtue. I hope that the similarities between Aristotle's account and Seller's account are pretty clear, um, but it's basically the same idea, just with respect to knowledge claims. All right, so Davidson. Davidson um, argues that most of our beliefs are true. Okay, He's a kind of coherentist. But how does he justify that claim? Um, well, in opposition to someone like Chisholm, and really I would think maybe even someone like Sellers, um, who grounds uh, this ability to say certain things on the presupposition that you're causally related to the world um, in such a way that that causal relation does give you justification. Sellers does think that the foundation is there, it's just that it kind of comes all together through long periods of teaching. Davidson, on the other hand, thinks that Importantly, the relations between things that impinge on your senses, objects in the world, and your senses, and the relation between beliefs are metaphysically and conceptually mutually con con exclusive. Sorry. So if it's a justificatory relation between something, it can't be a causal relation between something. And if it's a causal relation between something, then it can't be a justificatory relation between something. Um, this is kind of working in the background for him. So he starts by saying, um, or addressing this question by rejecting the move to found knowledge on some kind of relation or grounding or foundation that connects us to the world. Um, he just does not think that that idea is a good one, and he actually believes that um, it leads one to skepticism about other minds. I'm not sure why skepticism about other minds is the one he chooses, but. Um, Presumably, skepticism in general also follows when you try to do this. So his argument um, 
to the effect that the relations uh, justificatory and causal are distinct is as I've uh, written them out here. So um, we make note of the fact that justification is a logical relation among beliefs. The rest of what I write here is just cashing out what that means. Uh, so the claim P justifies Q is true if P, or if Q stands to P rather, as uh, dependent on P qua reason for believing that Q. P is a reason to believe Q, i.e. justifies the belief that Q just in case P is true and the content of P quote, goes beyond itself to imply that Q. Um, and then I give the example of it's raining, right? So um, the claim it's raining, if true, means something such that it goes beyond itself and implies things like that things outside will be wet. And so if someone says it's raining and you take them to be asserting that and you take it to be true, then you know in virtue of the meaning of that assertion that things will be wet. You can infer to the claim that things will be wet, right? On the other hand, the relation between the impingement on the sense organs by physical objects in the world um, and the sense organs themselves uh, is a causal relation. And this is clearly the case when you look at um, the cognitive and cognitive neuroscience literature. Light waves bounce off of objects and uh, travel into our eyes and excite neurons um, in our retinas and that excitement is then processed through the optical nerve to the occipital lobe and then processed down into the medial temporal lobes and presumably we have imagistic experience as a result, right? visual processing, say. Um, and all of that explanation is causal. It's all A causes B, which then is followed by C, which causes D, and the end result is E, right? Um, there is no logical relation in the sense of logical that Davidson is concerned with, and clearly not justification. Your optic nerve doesn't process light uh, because it's dependent in some way on the nerves in the retina. Uh, it's, it's not logically dependent on those nerves. It is causally dependent on those nerves. Those nerves need to be there in order to be excited um, in such a way that causes the optic nerve to process the way that it does. But that relation isn't one of logical uh, or justificatory dependence, right? So he says from this, that causal relations are not logical relations, though causal relations can be referred to in statements that have a logical relation to other statements. So conclusion one, the causal relation between the senses and what impinges on them is not justificatory. And conclusion two, neither knowledge nor our suspicion that most of our beliefs are true can be ground, grounded uh, on the relation between the sense the senses and the sense organs and uh, that which impinges on them. I see a typo there, but it's fine. Um, so this is his argument against the temptation to get the claim that our beliefs are mostly true out of uh, grounding of our beliefs um, to the world via the senses. This is his argument against the given. So what's Davidson's alternative strategy? Well, he goes in for a Quinean solution, uh, which he calls radical translation, and he develops a principle of charity. So as he admits, we need a reason to think that our beliefs are true. So um, one way to do this would be to understand, to better understand what belief is uh, in the first place. So we can understand what belief is, he thinks, by a detour through interpretation. And this he's getting from Quine. 
you might think, well, how? How does that work? Well, we can ask two questions. We can ask what a person believes and what he means by any given expression. Um, oh, another typo. Usually, though, not always. Making sense of what someone says will require or presuppose that the world is one way or another. So for someone's use of the proposition or expression, esta es verde, to mean the proposition this is green, requires, among other things, that the thing denoted by, quote, this uh, actually be green. So, and this is the claim that I was referring to when I used the casa example. In order to get to the conclusion that casa means house, it just has to be the case that um, some uses of the term uh, are explained by the, pre the presence of the house to which that use of the term refers, right? So they're just, for casa to mean house in general, there just have to be times when using the word casa uh, actually felicitously refers to some house. And that house has to be there. So then um, Davidson, kind of generalizing from this moral, um, says that if we imagine trying to translate a language entirely alien to us via communication with some of the uh, natural practitioners of that language, um, we find that our ability to understand what is said in that language requires us to assume or presuppose that most of the time our interlocutor is, you know, when saying things about the world at least, uh, speaking the truth, right? Um, they're at least saying things that are true, right? And this is a principle of charity. This is the principle of charity. The assumption that, on the whole, when people are saying things that are truth valuable, uh, what they're saying is true. Ceteris paribus, of course, um, since if you walk into a playhouse, you should suspend that principle, since uh, the relevant context determines that you should. But nevertheless, you should apply the principle of charity um, for the most part, in most contexts. Uh, yeah, unless there's a reason to do otherwise. So, to kind of unpack that, we might say that we have to think that um, the person expresses statements which are for the most part true um, in order to even understand what they mean. If there's not a reliable connection between houses and the utterance of the word casa, we're going to be less inclined to think that casa means house, right? Um, thus, the truth of a belief, or the truth of belief in general, and the meaning of statements are um, closely interlinked. One wouldn't normally assert what they do unless they believed what they were uh, to assert was true, and one's assertion can only be understood if we assume that one is usually saying something true. Both tacitly suppose a kind of non-mysterious, at least partially causal connection with the world, but not, importantly, not an appeal to causal relations um, in order to get at justificatory relations. He uh, supposes this objection to his own view what if both the translator and the translated are systematically mistaken? So what if, even though we should presuppose that everything the person says, or most of it, is true, um, what stops it from being the case that we're both brains and bats, or being systematically deceived by an evil demon? Uh, he replies on the same page that we can imagine an omniscient interpreter or translator who knows everything but the alien languages, and then he wants to know what we mean when we're saying things. Well, clearly he would go through the same process that we do. 
And because he's omniscient, that just means that the standards by which he judges um, the truth or falsity of our in, of, of any instance of a claim, of any, any given claim, um, those standards that he applies are objective and so um, not liable to any doubt. But the fact that he would have to go through the same process that we do and because his standards are objective, he would find that for the most part, as a matter of fact, we were right, um, or to put it another way, put it in the right way, that uh, most of what we said was true, um, despite our fallibility. So this just basically is meant to show that um, assuming objectivity, the method of interpretation becomes um, as solid as possible, and we don't need the objectivity necessarily, um, because the method of interpretation by itself is a bulwark against skepticism. Um, if it's the right methodology and Davidson's coherentism uh, is true, then most of our beliefs, it follows at least that most of our beliefs are true. You may